Hey, everybody. Uh, this is your professor, uh, Aaron Rosari. And let me just get the screen set up. Uh, so this week we looked at uh, an article. I don't know if it's famous. It's originally appeared in the Atlantic. It's one of the articles in bioethics that did get kind of a uh, a mainstream reading. A lot of people who don't study bioethics for a living uh, found Leon Cass's uh, reflections on biotechnology and biological enhancement, uh, something that'll become increasingly possible to do as the technologies advance. A lot of people find his uh, his reflections on these questions to be very useful, and very wise. Um, it's not like everybody agrees with everything he says. There's there's plenty to argue about, uh, but he raises questions about the use of technology that perhaps are not raised enough. So it's the purpose of this. Um, discussion to kind of go through the reading questions on his article ageless bodies happy souls and uh, just get at some of that wisdom about whether or not we should proceed with biological and other genetic enhancements of both our intellect and mental capacities as well as our physical capacities a little bit of background leon cass was a uh, the head of a bioethics commission uh, during the early 2000s, that was commissioned by uh, Bush the Younger, George W. Bush. Uh, the Human Genome Project had just been recently completed, and with the thorough mapping of every gene in the human body, uh, which is kind of like a lot like a computer code, there was opportunity to rewrite that code and to manipulate it in ways that we couldn't have dreamed of even a couple decades ago. Uh, so now that we've mapped the human, human genome and know how to program <laughs> uh, for different traits, uh, the future is, is kind of wide open. So that's, that's why we're having this discussion. And it ties into a number of discussions we've already had uh, resource management, can we afford enhancement when we can barely cover everybody's basic needs or therapies? Uh, the control, um, yeah, so that's probably the main issue we've covered thus far that kind of ties into this. Um, a little bit about genetic choice. Uh, so with uh, various tests for genetic markers for uh, preborn infants, uh, in utero, um, that leads to a lot of medical choices. Okay, so let's just get started. Um, all right, so this, this is in response to question 1B. Uh, what particular question will be the mo main focus of this essay? I'm going to skip 1A, which is just some possible bad uses of biotechnology. He just lists them right at the beginning. Nothing too difficult there. So here's the main question. Is the use of biotechnology to pursue perfection of both body and mind a good idea? So by soul, he means something like mind in the title, ageless bodies, happy souls. All right. So looking forward, Cass will discuss three types of genetic and or drug-based enhancements, usually focuses on the genetic ones. These have to do with mood regulation, uh, so, or, or what if we can just get rid of sadness altogether? Is that a good idea? Lifespan enhancement. What if instead of living to an average age of 80, we extend it to 120 or 160? And then intellectual enhancement, such as IQ enhancement. So what if you can make all your children as smart as Einstein? Should you? And these questions are so fascinating because they get at the heart of what it means to be a human being. Because we're literally capable now, increasingly capable of altering our basic capacities. And we'll only get better at doing that as time goes on. All right. 
Now, Cash gives an early warning. So this is in relation uh, to question 1C. Uh, Cass notes something significant about medical advances that have already been achieved. Have they led to an increase in happiness? <clears throat> and the data shows they have not. So Cass notes that recent gains in health and longevity have only created the desire for further gains and have not produced widespread contentment. Uh, this will be a general theme throughout the article. As we reset what is normal, we're always craving to be better than that new standard of normal. And uh, if we can mess with our own genetics, that there's no natural limit to what we can pursue. So it creates this state of perpetual deprivation, maybe, where no level of enhancement uh, is ever going to be enough. So that's a fear that Cass kind of puts out there. And the data thus far kind of indicates that that's how we tend to think about these things. With every advance, we kind of want a further one. All right, so that's just something to keep in mind. Okay, now, uh, there's a section in the article. It starts on page 12. Uh, page 12 of the, on those article pages, not the PDF pages. Um, and it's called Problems with Terminology. Uh, now, one important distinction you often find in the literature, and it's not only in metaethics literature, insurance companies employ this, is the distinction between a medical procedure that's a therapy and one that's an enhancement. So this is not the exact same phrasing as the article, but the basic idea is therapy is getting one's body or mind back to a normal level of functioning. So these are medically necessary uh, procedures, whereas enhancement is getting one's body or mind to perform above normal. And these are typically not medically necessary. So just think of something like cosmetic surgery. Uh, so the point of that isn't strictly speaking medical, usually. It's usually just for aesthetics. Uh, someone wants to look a little differently than they do, so they may go get cosmetic surgery. Now, sometimes it's a therapy. So let's say you were in a, an accident and you have some scarring and you just want to look like you used to look. So the removal of scarring, that's cosmetic surgery. That's that's therapy. That's getting you back to the way things were. Uh, but if you're going above and beyond what things were in a non-medically necessary way, that's enhancement. So that's that third point here. Therapies are seen as needs and enhancement as wants. Um, now Cass, he's, the reason he brings this up is he knows that a lot of current funding of medical procedures through insurance, for example, is dictated by what category, um, the procedure falls under. Uh, but he says, okay, that might be a rough and ready guide for, what procedures we should fund or at least prioritize our funding for. Uh, but it's it's not crystal clear always where you draw the therapy enhancement distinction. Um, so it's going to be an imperfect guide. And this in the article, it serves as a bridge for him to ask deeper questions about these procedures. Are they even good in the first place? The, the enhancements, that is. Uh, but he just spends a little time uh, kind of pointing out some difficulties with the basic therapy enhancement distinction itself. Um, now, when you think of it, so look at this, these concerns. Some enhancements reduce functionality. So we usually want to think of an enhancement as an increase in ability. Uh, but some procedures that are at least being worked on, they do things like blot out painful memories. Uh, so that's reducing the range of which past events in your life your memory has access to. Now, you could see why someone who's been the victim of trauma may benefit from such a procedure. Um, but it's weird to call it an enhancement of memory, uh, even though it's some sort of alteration for a purpose that a person considers beneficial. Uh, you're actually reducing the functionality of memory. So it's hard to um, think of therapy enhancement 
that distinction just in terms of normal functioning and level and diversity of function. Um, and then he raises some concerns about what constitutes normal functioning. So just to give you a sense of what he has in mind here, I spent a couple of years overseas living in Armenia and the average male in Armenia uh, drops dead uh, right around the age 50. Like that's the statistical norm. That's quote unquote normal. Um, whereas in the U.S., the statistical norm uh, for men is, is right around 80 years old. So there's cross-cultural variations in what is considered normal, uh, both in terms of what's statistically most common, and that also affects our expectations and what we should trying to be get and what we should be shooting for, I guess, is a good way to say that. And then he also notes that there's a fine line between pursuing mental health, which is intuitively a form of therapy, and pursuing perhaps enhanced well-being, which isn't, isn't really ther therapy. It's beneficial, uh, but if you're just trying to maximize uh, your peace, contentment, and joy, it seems at one point uh, you're going above and beyond uh, mere ther therapy, but it's radically unclear where to where to draw that line or where to make that boundary. So that's all he's getting out of that discuss discussion. And again, the reason he brings this up is he wants to dig deeper anyway. He wants to look at specific types of enhancement and he wants to see if pursuing those enhancement projects are going to deprive our lives of various types of meaning and significance. So that's where he's headed. Okay. Now, uh, I'm skipping discussion of questions three and four. Uh, question four is this really technical point he made. I think the next time I, I give this assignment, I'm just going to drop it. Uh, four is based on a book uh, written by C.S. Lewis called The Abolition of Man. And it has to do with, uh, well, it has to do with the objectivity of value um so i'm going to skip that discussion and then question three concerns what he calls the three obvious objections uh two new enhancement technologies and i think again that doesn't get to the deepest part of what he's after and they, they have to do with safety they have to do with quality um freedom those are his three categories, and they're important, so go ahead and read that. But in this, this essay, I kind of want to get to some of the deeper, in this lecture, some of the deeper material. Um, yeah, so let's go to question five. So question five reads, in the middle of page 19, there's a quote from Michael Sandel on the giftedness of life. So what does he mean by giftedness and why does viewing life from this perspective uh, promote uh, humility? Um, and this will be a nice transition to the next question, question six. Okay, so here, here's Sandel's idea. What we are born as and the fact that we are born at all, these aren't things we can control. Because of this lack of control, we take our life and we take our basic nature as a given. And that which is simply a given, not something you control, something you receive, is often experienced as a gift. And this can promote a certain sort of humility. Uh, all he has in mind here is if you can adopt this attitude toward yourself or toward other people, He's going to tie this into reproduction uh, in a bit. Uh, we see people as they are, as something special, as something that was, again, given, but not because of, you know, not something humans necessarily made in any kind of detail. Of course, human decision-making goes into reproduction, but but the result is not something at, at present that we precisely control. So we tend to see life as a gift, uh, ours and other people's, such as children. Okay. But, so Sandel is worried 
that we might undermine this perspective on ourselves and on our descendants uh, if we have too much control over who and what we are or who and what our children are. So, um, trivial example, let's say we didn't, pretend we didn't have the ability to dye our hair. Um, and let's say one person's got brown hair, another person has blonde hair, another person has black hair or brunette. Um, you just kind of have to accept that and you have to accept what's unique about it. And you just kind of have to kind of be thankful for what you have. But if you can dye your hair, hmm, well, maybe I don't like brown hair. Maybe I don't like blonde hair. Maybe I want blue hair. Uh, so a cost of being able to dye one's hair is one is more likely to be dissatisfied with the color they actually have. So this leads to a more serious example. What if we can genetically modify children to have the traits that we want? Would they be seen as more of a gift or as a project, a kind of science project? Um, and just think about how we might be less likely as a parent to appreciate who and what they are if we uh, got together with a team of geneticists and we're targeting certain traits uh, that could undermine our ability to appreciate them as they are and... Um, give us really specific expectations for how they want them, how we want them to be. That's the sort of concern that can Michael Sandel's onto. He's a professor at Princeton, by the way, he writes a lot on justice and genetics and that sort of thing. Okay. Now this leads into question six. Um, Cass is taking Sandel's insights. And as we've already started doing, he applies them to reproduction and he wants to ask the question is reproduction the natural way uh, without a lot of sciency based interventions is that a good and is it a good worth preserving and again we're not talking about therapy obviously if uh, you or your child has some sort of genetically grounded uh, disease that can be treated. Cass is just as on board as the rest of us with doing those treatments. He's more concerned about kind of like constructing children or constructing ourselves and remaking our basic self uh, or our children's selves in a way that fits a very specific set of values. Okay, so here's his defense of the goodness at least under normal circumstances, of traditional procreation. He says, ideally and often, children are a manifestation of eros, which is the Greek word uh, for kind of erotic love and other types of love. Uh, children have a meaning. They genetically represent the coming together of two family lines. Children have their own unique personality and traits that are slowly revealed. And Cass's concern is that this can all be undermined by genetic intervention. The very meaning of what a child is can be altered. So let's say you want your kid to have, a, you know, like a 160 IQ and to um, develop an interest in music. And let's say someday we understand the brain and its structures enough and what pieces of the genetic code go into brain development later. And let's say, at least with some statistical probability, we can increase the odds of kids having that higher IQ or having that interest in music. Okay, now imagine your kid's born <laughs> and they're just average intelligence, despite the intervention, and uh, they don't like music at all. Like maybe they like playing golf. I don't know. Um, you're setting yourself up for disappointment. As the parent, you're setting the child up for a set of expect to live up to a set of expectations that were predetermined and have nothing to do with what the child is actually like. Uh, so that third 
point. Children have their own unique personality and traits that are slowly revealed. Well, if we're designing children, we might not appreciate who they are, and uh, we might know ahead of time what they're likely to be like, and that that disrupts a very, very good ways of appreciating kids. And think of that second point. Children genetically represent the coming together of two family lines. Well, now it's two family lines and a team of geneticists. Uh, so again, it's a little more laboratory, uh, a little more detached from these deeper histories. Um, yeah, so that's the sort of concern Cass is raising and Sandel as well. Uh, the meaning of children will be fundamentally altered if we can control the result. Okay, now question 6b says, uh, Cass also notes that our strengths and limits allow us to fill various societal roles. How might the ability to enhance any ability at will make us less reliant on each other? Um, and he's just making that second point on the under basic ideas is probably the key one. Reliance on each other is the source of community. Uh, we see this with technology already. I used to go for walks, and if I didn't know how to get somewhere, like say I was out of town, I would ask somebody. Uh, but now the expectation is I would just pull out my iPhone and look up how to go somewhere on the iPhone. So there's a cutting off of social contact, there's, and that disrupts our ability to embed in the culture and to rely on others and to have them rely on us. Um, and this would be on steroids if we could not only access uh, information and machines that can do work that humans once did for us, uh, but if we ourselves had these, we can just kind of implant these abilities at will, uh, what we'd be creating is increasingly self-sufficient and capable individuals that didn't have much of a need to rely on each other. And this would promote an unhealthy individualism. At least that's the concern. Okay. And that last point on the slides with mentioning too, enhanced individuals may struggle to relate to others. So there might be a point where only a few of us are getting enhanced or our children or our children's children are getting enhanced. And they might be thought of as just outsiders, uh, to use a horrible phrase, a kind of genetic freak in a way, like someone who um, is just so different than the normal humans around them. Uh, there's going to be that trouble relating and being accepted and so on and so forth. Okay. All right, so question seven, um, quote from that question, Cass says, a drug to induce fearlessness uh, does not produce courage. And he's talking about people who will be able to take pills to block from memory, painful or hateful aspects of a new experience. Um, so anytime you don't like something, maybe you can get rid of the pain it causes. Now, again, in cases of severe trauma where a person's just basic functioning in life has been disrupted, it might be a great idea to erase the memory of a specific traumatic event or small set of events. But if we take it too far and we can just get rid of anything painful, either through memory erasure or maybe um, either drug therapy or a genetic therapy that operates directly on our moods, um, there's going to be some problems with that. So, so the question we're addressing is, um, why doesn't getting rid of things like fear artificially, why doesn't that produce courage? Now, the background is uh, very Aristotelian, going back to Aristotle's approach to ethics. Um, Courage is a classic moral virtue. It's the virtue one possesses when one is skilled at facing danger and overcoming fear when it's appropriate to do so. And us mere mortals who are not genetically enhanced, we can grow in our courage through experience. 
Uh, we could train ourselves or be trained by others by facing dangerous or uncomfortable situations to gain this ability to kind of like push through and develop perseverance and face danger. And, um, but if we could just simply blot out the fearful element or the experience of the fearful element. So on the slide, it says uh, there's two problems with this. Well, one is there's nothing to overcome. So you're not actually courageous. You're not overcoming fear. You're not developing the skill of taming your emotion and not letting it control you. You're not learning self-control. You're just deadening the negative emotion. Uh, so you're not really developing your character by dealing with fear in this way. So this is a downside of mood enhancement. And second point is not all fears should be overcome. Like you wouldn't want to just walk into traffic fearlessly. Uh, that would be reckless. That wouldn't be courageous. Uh, you just get run over. Um, so there's a certain wisdom to fear. Uh, some things should be feared. Some should not be. And through the course of life experience, we have the opportunity to learn those distinctions and behave accordingly. And all that would be lost if we were simply extinguishing the negative emotion itself. Okay. Um, all right. So a couple questions left. Question eight uh, reads as follows. On page 22, Cass talks about the deep structure of human activity. Describe this structure. And this ties into that prior question about cultivating courage. So we typically achieve important results through exerting ourselves and developing our skills and abilities. Success is a result of training, effort, and struggle. These struggles shape our character as well as giving us the desired result. So the human meaning of an achievement is undermined when skills come with no effort. There was no need to cultivate your own personality in a certain direction. Um, you're likely to not appreciate the result as much because it's not going to be attached to a history of effort and sacrifice. So again, Cass's worry is that if we can simply augment our abilities even our moral abilities, like what if we just become these uh, fearless people um, or uh, something like that, um, the meaning behind it might be lost. So that's the idea. If it's not a result of toil and effort, the appreciation goes down. And if you can dig a little deeper, it's not really your achievement. It's the achievement of the enhancer. It's the achievement of the drug. It's not properly credited to you. Hence that last point, the human meaning of an achievement is underlined, undermined. Okay. Now, question nine deals with uh, one more type of enhancement that Cass discusses. Um, there's a... Lots of research being done to either extend the human life cycle. So maybe instead of dropping dead at 80, we drop dead at 120 or 160. And there's also efforts to prolong the most, our ability to be active for longer and longer stretches. Uh, so in sports, even though this is not genetic enhancement, uh, the various supplements, training regimens, knowledge about radical increase in knowledge about the body. You know, athletes can already extend their careers considerably longer than they used to be able to. Like Tom Brady famously played quarterback till he was about 43. Uh, LeBron James is going to do a few more years of basketball. Even a decade ago, he would be out of the game already. Um now imagine ramping that up so we can reverse what is called programmed cell death. Uh, so we can just double the human lifespan or what if, um, yeah, we can just genetically strengthen our musculature and such so that could, we can remain active well into our 60s or 70s. What could possibly be wrong with that? 
Well, CAS lists a couple of things. So here is the human life cycle. We have a phase of activity, uh, youth and middle age. We kind of peak in productivity, uh, at least in vocations and work, uh, typically in our 40s, and then kind of slowly decline after that. And athletically, we, we peak in our late 20s. Um, and after those phases of life where we're most active, we have an age of reflection. We slow down. We can only do less than we used to be able to do. And this allows us to be elders to those who are still more active and younger than us. It allows us to prepare for death and the end of life. And it allows for just general reflection on the meaning and value of what our life has been and how to pass that on to the next generation. So Cass's concern is that if we greatly expand the life cycle or extend the activity phase, there are bad side effects. Uh, that reflection phase is short-circuited, perhaps, and uh, the younger generation simply can't take over. Um, no one ever retires, <laughs> at least not until much later than they used to, and it creates kind of like a backlog, and there's not this generational transfer of responsibility. Okay, so that's a good bit. I think that's enough for today. Um hope you enjoyed reading this article. I think it is filled with a certain sort of wisdom. Uh, so having read this uh, or listened to this, please proceed to the discussion board and good luck on those questions. Uh, thank you.